Hey, it is your buddy, Peace and Harmony, with you here today. Much love going out to all the beautiful Empowered Harmonizers. And we are zooming in and focusing in on what I feel is a great viewer question. And that is to look at childhood incidences or childhood reasons or incidences that create codependency in a person. Um, so in other words, what are some experiences early on in one's life when one is very susceptible, very much open and impressionable? What are some situations that could have occurred in your life that have kind of set you up to be codependent in nature? In other words, caring more about other people's feelings, needs, wishes, desires, their achievements than fostering that through your own having that own internal locus of control, feeling that you value yourself and that it's okay to value yourself. So where does this all go awry? How does basically a young child, what do they experience or what's an example of an event either, you know, through your, your infancy, your toddlerhood, your elementary school, your junior high. I mean, childhood is really, you know, what you would call it. Some people have to end up though growing up too soon. Um, where they have to be engaged in what she calls um, parentification. In other words, where a child, because of disorder in the family, they have to be, they have to take on the role of like a surrogate parent, like a, have a higher mentality, um, being able to solve problems, you know, because the parent has so many issues themselves that they take attention off of the child. Um, and... So basically there's so much in that question. It's so packed. And, um, and so I really want you to though focus in and see how perhaps you can identify situations in your own upbringing or somewhere along your life or your perspective in your experience where this has occurred and then send things going into a codependent sort of methodology towards your, you know, your, your position in relationships. In other words, where you felt that you always had to take the lowest on the totem pole. You always had to take the back to the back to the back seat. You always had to be the one who was quieter, who couldn't laugh, who couldn't lead, who didn't have talent. So where did this all begin? Because it's a very gradual decline. And, but you know, when you're a child though, you are growing by leaps and bounds. So it's very important to understand that children and how formidable years these are in your lifespan, that how they really kind of set you up as the foundation for having these sorts of relationships or tolerating them is more the importance, you know, because everybody will usually encounter someone who is narcissistic or even more severely psychopathic in their life, whether they succumb to this person are, you know, um, tolerating of abuse, um, target, uh, targeted or, um, maintain an abusive relationship really depends on the individual. So it's very much important to understand that children are like a sponge. They will absorb everything and all associations that are set up that are, are, you know, the brain likes to work on associations. So children are like a sponge. And so they begin to then gather meaning about their, their environment as well as themselves and don't really separate it. They don't really have a, a boundary. Um, healthy parenting hasn't given, you know, them this sort of understanding of boundary or boundary cre creation, boundary maintain, you know, um, maintenance or what it feels like to have a healthy boundary and how to stand up for yourself. Oh, this is such a loaded question. Um, and so... When it comes to, you know, the child and their boundaries, i.e., you know, um, being able to have their room and feel okay and safe there, to feel that no one can intrude, no one can yell in there, um, that, you know, they then, you know, have their own interests, they have their own perspective, they have their own little reality, and, you know, to be able to engage in that, you know, from a parent-child, you know, the parent should be up here, the, the mature one, and then the child is like a sponge and trying to make sure above everything that their caregiver is happy because children very quickly learn that if their parents are unhappy, um, if they're drunk, if they are fighting, if they don't have money, 
if they, you know, are screaming and yelling, um, things are in disrepair, you know, they're not getting attention. They're not getting eye contact. They're not getting that warm, nurturing environment. In fact, they're receiving the absence and neglect of that. So they begin then to try to, you know, get those as, you know, those hierarchy of needs met and, you know, um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, you, people need food, they need shelter, you know, they need warmth, they need security, they need love, you know, and only then once they kind of get these, you know, satisfied, can they then begin to go into the social realm, you know, and begin to have, you know, relationships and self-actualize and become really, you know, the, the f full blossom of a human being that they can. But if the, if the boundaries are blurred, in other words, if their environment is wrought with this type of dysfunction, well, what are some sort of dysfunctions that could create codependency or parentification? Meaning that the child would have to feel that they must become invisible, that they must become you know, disinterested um, in their own excitement, that they must sort of lose their rights, that they must um, take criticism, uh, corporal punishment, you know, harsh criticism, harsh punishment, and that they are bad, you know, and they become then shamed and shame-based, feeling embarrassed, guilty. They can't show their face. Um, you know, they, they better not make a peep. You know, this sort of fearful you know, walking on eggshells. So it's to understand that codependency is very much set up in these formative years. If you're with someone who's always, in other words, they're not engaging the child on either their level or the parental level. In other words, they're always just sort of yell, you know, what are some incidences or what are some situations? If there's a, yell, a lot of yelling going on, there's a lot of sort of negative influence and the child is just sort of a passing, you know, gl glimpse in, um, you know, in this parent's eye that they're never really, you know, present. Um, so to have a lack of parental presence where you feel that their parent is just too busy, too, um, too involved, too self-involved. It's like a parent who has a constant toothache. All they can do is go, woe is me. And then everybody knows that this person is upset. So the child pretty soon learns that, well, I better take care of my caretaker. We've got then the parentification, i.e. the child is becoming the parent. The child is putting the parent to bed. The child is making sure that the, the parent gets enough to eat. The child is making sure that the parent has enough to wear, that they look good, that they're cool. They're, you know they're okay with things. And what can I do to change to make you happy? You seem so unhappy all the time. So these are, you know, examples of sort of incidences. If the parent is chronically unhappy or in quote unquote, you know, this other frame of mind, either they're carrying their work home with them. Well, the child can't relate to that, you know, so they'll feel like, well, then how can I soothe you? How can I get you to pay attention to me? So it'll either become the caretaking, i.e. parentification, where the child's brushing the parent's hair, practically dressing the, you know, the parent, maybe making them food, you know, cute little kid food. You, you see a role reversal here. And it's very sad because, because in this situation, it's like youth is wasted on the young. You know, this is their time to be taken care of. These are their formative years. You're foundational experience, you know, experiences are set up in childhood. So it's my feeling that that inner family circle that's, you know, that's part of, um, you know, your formative relationships that is then mimicked and played out in the variety of work circles, um, religious circles, interest circles. So you're, you're in that same role that your family has created for you, but you're then just exasperating it or you're, if it's a strong foundation, you're becoming stronger. If you've, if you've got some dysfunction there, you know, if you've got some codependency, you know, then you're always going to be the servitude. You're always going to feel like you have to register with other, you know, overly empathetic, codependent, 
overly empathetic. What does this person think? Did I say the right thing? You know, can I tell them what I'm feeling? Is this awkward? Everything feels awkward. You can't, you know, speak like an adult. You kind of feel like you're stuck in some stage of, you know, growth from, you know, you don't know if you're between seven and eight, nine and 12, yet you're in a human body. You know, you have this feeling of sort of immaturity or perhaps there's this regression. <clears throat> so the childhood reasons are because they need to have a stable routine and structure and caregiver. So the child then tries to create this and foster this within the parents. But the parents oftentimes is not routine, is not structured, is not stable. And so situations, you know, unstable employment, unstable living, you've had to move two, three, five, seven times. You've got a new best friend every year in first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade. You don't have any roots. You know, you don't have any, you know, parties, you know, that you can go to with kids that you've known for a long time. Um, you know, uh, situations where maybe your, you know, your, your family or your family had, you know, a revolving door of, of spouses whom your, your, your parent married. And so, or they had unhealthy, um, role models for you to mentor because you do, your parents are your first role models. And so if these were not healthy, and then you see the mother always doing this, you're, you're going to basically either imprint and be like the mother, or you're going to rebel and be completely not like the mother. And likewise, gravitate towards the father. And then always, you know, making sure that you've got the roof over your head, you've got your, your needs met. And so you begin to this parentification. So again, it is the is the child being a parent um, when they're they're clearly children? I mean, you've you've we've all seen it. Um, you know, kids who are taking down their parents like they're just you know they're thirteen going on thirty. Um, you know, there there can be just you know normal childhood spats who you know they're they're in their fits of growing stages, and oftentimes this can be a very good sign. However. Um, you know, there are situations where literally the kids have to do the cleanup. The kids have to do the meal. The kids have to worry or be like a peacemaker between the parents. They're afraid to take sides. Dad's one way, mom's another. You know, this person seems really, you know, ballistic. This person seems passive. You know, so where do you gravitate? So it becomes this whole, you know, I'm lost in the shuffle. Um codependency. I don't matter. You get the message. I don't matter. Your, your physicality doesn't matter. Your emotions don't matter. You know, your grades don't matter. Your learning, your friends, you feel sort of dehumanized and deconstructed. And yet, you know, you need to go out, you're growing and you know, you've got kids to play with and such, but yet you might be embarrassed to bring kids back to the home. You might be embarrassed because, you know, your parents are always yelling or your mother has never shown you the love. So you're afraid because you've seen how other families are modeled and you're like, that's not how my mother does me. That's not how my father does me. And so, you know, you're, you're kind of in that, you know, and then, so you're always kind of gravitating to that. Well, let me take care of you. Let's go to your place. Um, and then the codependency is fostered and made stronger. It's reinforced and rememorized. And it's just, it's just shredded within you. It's just imprinted and then toughened up in like fibrous material that is tough to break down. It becomes very tough, like the neurofibers. It's like the reticular activating system. The reticular activating system is a, a, a series of neurons and neural pathways in your brainstem, which cause you to focus. So it's a very interesting thing then because in situations of, um, you know, childhood, you know, where there, there's a lot of fear going on, you know, the, the children will become hypervigilant and then become very, uh, uh, you know, sensitive to cues. In other words, you hear a door slam, this means that. You hear a garbage pail, this means that. You begin developing all these associations so you're trying to like gauge which direction the environment is trying to go. Codependency. I don't matter. It's all about what's happening out there. I'm invisible. I'm a fly on the wall. 
you know, I better just find out what's going on and then, you know, become like camouflage and just blend in and try to make as much peace so that my needs can be met. So oftentimes the child would be very uncomfortable. Like, you know, sometimes it might register as they get older. You know, this is really awkward. The fact that I have to do this, you know, um, but yet they might often keep a, a, a tight lip. So the reticular activating system is a series of neural pathways in the brainstem, which causes you to focus. So just like the law of attraction says, what you focus on grows. So for example, and this is a quick example, if I were to say, don't think of pink, don't think of pink, what do you think about? Even though you said don't, the command is think of pink, think of pink. Your, your brain kind of works in that way. You know, in other words, there's a command there. Don't think of this. And so you think it. So in other words, don't think of fear, you know, and then, but you think of it. And so it's your reticular activating system. And this, I feel really gets blown out when then the codependent who has this and then goes, you know, furthermore into those psychopathic relationships or the malignant narcissistic where their reticular activating system is constantly on the narcissist or another person or a psychopath. So they fall back right into that groove like a silk glove, just like, you know, a, a hand in a, in a glove, a, a yoke in a shell. They just, whoop, you know, it's just like a complete perfect fit, um, physiologically, um, even though it is uncomfortable, even though it's unhealthy. So the reticular activating system will work towards commands, um, that you give it. That is how the brain works. So, um, it's just like, if you're shopping for cars, all of a sudden you you start looking at everybody's cars and you're like, I always, you know, notice the forest preserve, or I always notice the lake, or I always noticed, you know, the school here. And then, you know, now you're looking at everybody's cars. That's your reticular activating system, focusing on what is important to you. So the reticular activating system is part of that sort of natural, you know, neural network of of what happens, you know, while you're trying to secure your surroundings. In other words, um, you know, it's your, your secure, you know, you better, again, the children must take, you know, become the caregivers to make sure that the caregivers are there. So they become more obsessed, more concerned with their needs. And then that reticular activating system is always kind of with an ear to the door to the parents you know, or to whomever then, you know, the babysitter, the neighbor, it then begins to ripple over and carry over to anyone else then who's in the environment. So it can be the parents, then it can become the neighbors, then it can become the teachers, then it can become the boss, and then it can become this, you know, so all those roles, even though your mind could be open, and then receiving different, you know, solutions and things that are coming in when your reticular activating system is set up like that, all you can see is, you know, is that, you know, you're constantly looking for cars, you're constantly looking for safety, you're constantly looking for security outside of it, you know, you're, you're still on that hyper focus. Um, and also, you know, to obtain favor from an abusive or um, neglectful person by giving or having no boundaries. So in other words, um, being boundaryless, you know, being walked over then becomes self evaluation. I'm only, you know, I'll show you how, you know, accommodating I am, you know, I will do this and this, I'll show you how, you know, you know, giving and loving I am, you know, no boundaries, this boundaryless love, you know, which is not healthy, healthy, healthy relationships are defined by boundaries. People who haven't had healthy relationships are like, what are you talking about? I have never lived that way. I've never felt that way. And so it's very difficult for them to feel it and enforce it. So that reticular activating system then creates those associations. And then so people then, when they have that little bit, you know, opening experiences, either in college or their school or their work where they can go out and meet people or they can pursue their interests and other people, Hey, you know, they still have that fear or that codependency. So even though they could, you know, 
um, learn and, you know, grow in their character, um, it's basically, you know, they're always in the back of their mind. They've got that trauma bond. And if it hasn't been worked through, then they're going to stay in that mold. That neural network, once again, is going to be really tightly, rigidly formed so that it's still backing up that role. In other words, it's been so rehearsed and rememorized. It's like, learning to write your handwriting. I always write it this way. So that's like your handwriting. I mean, you can try to, you know, make it really super neat, you know, but your handwriting is going to be your handwriting. It's hardwired, you know, so it's what you've learned to do in school, what you were taught, and then you put your own physiology into it. Some people study handwriting. Um, and so it's to understand, to obtain favor from your parent, which means to win their love, to win their approval. So that the parent will treat you like the child and then you'd be able to have that healthy bond where there is at least one person in the world who cares if I'm sick, who cares if I'm happy, who cares if I got my grades, who cares if I got my meals, who cares if I'm warm, who cares if I'm cool, who cares if I'm, you know, got friends, who cares about me? You know, if there's one person who can give that to me, it's to be, you know, so the child will end up doing anything and oftentimes violating their boundaries to be as, as if they must extinguish themselves to be loved, you know, and then you, you have this overgiving, you know, um, you know, that they only are valued by the things that they give. So then you see these kids who are ultra giving to their parents, you know, and their parents maybe might not deserve it. Or, you know, these people who are, um, abusive and yet the child is still trying to, you know, clean dad up or make dad a picture, even though, you know, he's drinking, drinking in his coffees, you know, so you have the child still trying to pull the family together. I mean, someone has to do it. So children are very impressionable. They are like a sponge. They're picking up this and then they need to keep that caregiver alive. So it, it is very powerful relationship. Never, ever, ever underestimate the power of your family and your family relationships. Um, and so, and also, you know, no boundaries can be perpetuated because you just have not experience them or learned how to exercise or enforce them. In other words, I didn't learn, you know, no parent was there to show me, you know, how to handle my emotions or to how to handle a bully or how to handle advances from somebody. Um, I give in too easily, you know, um, someone tells me to do something and I'll, oh, okay, you know, and then you just do it. And then you're like, that was stupid, you know, and like, it's just, you know, you feel like your life is all over the place or that you're a walking mat or welcome mat or your boundary list. In other words, you just, you know, you're, you know, you, 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 you change or it's like, you know, you're too changeable, unstable, volatile. In other words, it depends what's around you. You don't have your own internal gauges going. I mean, again, this is such a packed subject. I mean, we could do this literally. I mean, there could be courses upon courses upon this. Um, and so, um, having no boundaries, oftentimes people who don't have boundaries. So w once again, what are boundaries saying? No, you know, knowing what are emotional boundaries, you know, how, um, how do I receive, you know, respect, love, um, eye contact, you know, what does respect feel like? And what happens if it doesn't, you know, that's a boundary. You're violating me, how to deal with violation, someone touching you inappropriately, Oh, I don't know what to do. I guess this is going to happen. You know, no boundaries. You know, um, people who get into um, trouble with financial boundaries. Oh, I didn't know that this was going to happen. You know, they just don't have the ability to enforce. They don't have the experience. They don't have the mentoring. Um, they weren't guided and shown. They didn't have the guidance. You know, no communication, no discussion, no examples. Um, you know, boundaries are so important and I, I refer to them all the time, boundaries and standards. Um, your boundaries, um, when you have them, you're then able to hear what unhealthy is and you're able to say no to it and you're able to sense what healthy is and say yes to it. So your body naturally wants to survive and be joyful. And that might be, you know, and to be happy, you know, you are not meant to live, you know, a spineless, um, without 
direction without boundaries, without standards. You know, you're not this formless being, you know, you have distinction, you have desire, you have, you know, abilities, um, inherent within you. Um, and so it is of course that until you become aware and cognizant can only these things change. And we're going to wrap it up here in a few minutes. Um, and I want you to understand that very important is to understand the associations that are made when these relationships are taking place. So in other words, when the codependency, for example, codependency, I must always base my value on how well I take care of others or, you know, all that matters is that they're happy. And so I can't navigate my day and just be happy taking care of myself. You know, every, all the best stuff goes over here. All, you know, my, you know, is always on the other person. I must look good for somebody. I must drive this car for somebody. I must have this degree for somebody. It's always an external locus of control. I mean, we, we, we've started on this. I mean, there's just so much. Um, it's actually quite fascinating. And then when we get into then how these people then are set up for relationships with a psychopath or malignant narcissist, it's just, it goes out of the water. I mean, it just, it just goes really, really full circle. Um, and so, of course, you're going to display this in your adult relationship. So it's never too late to learn. In fact, now when you're an adult, you have the mental ability to be able to then reparent and then, you know, and other videos we're, we're going to be discussing more, you know, what do healthy relationships then feel like after you've had this whole truckload of crap relationships or, you know, um, unhealthy, dysfunctional relationships with narcissists, psychopaths, antisocial people, people who take advantage of you. You're just not, you know, you're, you're not happy with the role and how you're treated. You feel like you're, you know, a magnet for this. Um, is to understand, okay, the associations that you make and then to change and alchemize the associations. It's very important to also understand and get a hold of your reticular activating system. So your reticular activating system is like in your unconscious. It's in your brainstream. It's in the millions of year old aspect of your brain. And so <clears throat> naturally, without even you, you are going to pull into your life people who are just like this, who are going to take advantage and be the exact same way, but even worse than these parental relationships. So, you know, it go, it can go in a lot of directions. And we're going to talk about how, how can you mm, sidestep it so it goes healthy. That's really crucial. But it's very important to understand the reason if you are then finding yourself always obsessed, always the you know, one who's got the problem, who's getting walked on, who's getting cheated on, who's da da da, always, always, always. And it's been like this, you know, here comes, I thought this guy was different. I thought this girl was different. It's the same guy, as I say, in a different pair of shoes. It's the same girl in a different dress. It's the same. It's, the, you know, it just carries on. It's because your reticular activating system is subconsciously picking up and bringing you to these people. Did you learn the lesson? Did you learn the lesson? Did you learn the lesson? You know, you're a perfect fit. Of course, if I've said it, as I use a lot of analogies, if you've only been trained to be a secretary, all you're going to apply for are secretary jobs. If you have a lot of experience being an expert welder, you're going to find yourself in a lot of weldering positions. If you are, you know, an expert whatever, whatever you're going to, you know, if you're an expert surgeon, you're going to find yourself working for a lot of hospitals or outpatient surgical centers. Do you see what I'm getting at? So if you have a lot of experience in a, then you're going to look at a position where a is needed, valued position. So you're going to naturally gravitate, you know, so it's very important that we talk about resensitizing yourself in understanding what it is you get attracted to and go, wow, maybe not. Um, no, I am not believing that crock o lies. Hold it right here. And then your reticular activating system then which causes the obsession is to go, no, you know what? It's not a big deal. This is not triggering me. 
this person might be trying to poke me with saying this, with doing this, trying to create fear in me. So that's when we get into the conscious and deliberate manipulation for, for people who they think are weak, don't know better, who will fall prey to them. OMG. Then you've got a whole nother situation down with someone who's psychopathic trying to trigger your weaknesses, your vulnerabilities. And then you've got that whole reticular activating system. I can't stop thinking about them. You're, you know, you're, you've bought into their lie. You know, you, you haven't stepped aside and then shrunk them down to size because the psychopath, if I've said, they're like the billboard in your face. You can't see anything but them. The psychopath, all they want you to do is to think about them. So realize if you have this person who's taking up this huge, gigantic amount of energy in your life, that's a huge red flag. You are dealing with someone who is putting you back, regressing you into these childish roles where you're going to not be receiving what you deserve, the respect, the courtesy, the boundaries. You know, you need to learn then what these are and enforcing them and practice this. But you must understand what they are in order to practice. It's the awareness. It's the consciousness. Eventually, it all comes together. You have to stay the course. Do not give up. This is your buddy. Peace and harmony with you here today. And I hope that these videos do help. Please share and please subscribe for more great tools, videos, discussion, and support. Peace out. Love you.